Keeping it real with Jillian Michaels. We are back with Dr. Joseph Munoz, the hungry brain. Are you ready to tell me fact or fiction? BS sure. or brilliance? Here sure, we go. <laughs> Everyone's brain hates it when they lose weight. It doesn't matter your starting point. You could start from a point where you are athletic versus someone who's not athletic, couch potato type, phenotype. The moment you lose a little bit of weight, we're talking even a few pounds. What happens in your brain is your brain is used to you carrying, a, you or me carrying a certain amount of weight. The moment your weight starts to go down, you know, this is a big flag comes up. This reduce, this is reducing my chance of survival. This is what the brain thinks. And so what it does is it begins to use strategies, not conscious, nothing to do with our brain, anything like that, to drag us back up, kicking and screaming to where we were before. Okay. So so I just want to throw this out at you just just forget. In my experience, and I you'll handle the science, right? In yeah. my experience, and I, I could be wrong, maybe I'm wrong. When I help people that are obese or overweight to an unhealthy degree, not the ones that have the vanity pounds that you would already get like a clean bill of health from the doctor. I find that to be much more difficult, much more nuanced because the body is kind of like, really, are you sure? Like I'm healthy, I don't know. And if they push too hard, I've had to bring that calorie deficit down to like 500 calories a day, slow them down, more rest and make it more gradual. But with people that are overweight and unhealthy, I don't see this for quite some time in my experience. It, 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 now, I do know like, okay, you're losing weight. You hit a certain number. Your body will plateau for a little while. I give them a few more calories, a couple of rest days. We keep it rolling. And in order to keep metabolism strong, we do exercise and strength training. I'm willing to be wrong here. Like, I, 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 am I wrong? Is he right? Is this nuanced? Because this is kind of a crappy message, sort of. Because if you're listening to it, you're like, oh, I'm screwed. I'm never going to be able to lose weight. My brain is going to sub sabotage me subversively. Yeah. So like, what's true? What isn't? What do we do about the things that are true? Sure. Um, you know, this one is a little nuanced. Okay. What I do not like about it is what you mentioned, that it makes it seem as though people who want to lose weight are helpless. Right. right? And both you and I know that that's not true because both you and I have helped Hundreds of people, right? I've worked with people one-on-one -on -one and seen how powerful nutrition and exercise-related interventions can be for improving health and improving body composition. Okay. It is very, very possible for somebody to not only lose weight, but maintain weight loss. It's difficult because you have to change a lot of things. Right, of course. But it's definitely possible, right? And, okay, let's tackle this from a, a couple of different perspectives. First and foremost... I think it's really important to bring up the fact that people don't gain weight just because of their brain and their physiology. There's a lot of environmental factors. Right. right? Yeah. Of course. You're raised the way like you, uh, the reasons why you eat. Some people binge eat when they're sad and depressed and maybe because of certain circumstances in their life, they're sad and depressed often. Are we going to say that it's not more difficult for somebody like that to make changes? Of course, it's probably more difficult for somebody like that to make changes, but that doesn't mean that they're impossible. But the whole point that I'm trying to make here is that there are environmental factors as well. It's just, it's not just physiological factors affecting body weight. Right. right? So that's the first point that I want to make. The next point is let's talk, let's talk about some of the specific things that he mentioned that hold some truth, but then I'll talk about why I think the argument doesn't really hold a lot of, val uh, a lot of value. So. He said that when you lose weight, your brain sends signals that make you hungrier and want you to eat more. That is partially true. When we lose, but it, it's, it's really complex. I'm going to talk about why. So we have two main hormones. I'm sure you've heard of leptin. I'm sure you've heard, heard of ghrelin. Yep. There are a number of other hormones that are involved in hunger and satiety regulation, but those are like the two most popular ones. Right. right? When you lose weight, and, and by the way, leptin essentially tells your brain, leptin is produced in fat. And it tells your brain that you're full, essentially. Right. And ghrelin does the opposite. Tells you okay? you're hungry. Tells your brain that you're hungry. Okay? So there is a lot of data showing that when people lose weight, there is a reduction in their leptin production, which is common sense because leptin is produced in fat tissue. And so body fat, less fat going down. Less okay. Leptin. And the opposite is also true, that ghrelin levels tend to increase. Okay? Now, here's where it gets a little bit nuanced. 
Everybody's heard of insulin resistance. Yes. Right? Leptin insulin resistance. Is that where you're going? Got yeah, it. Yep. Okay. It, it, it's essentially like you produce insulin, but insulin doesn't work the way that it's supposed to, right? Yeah. There's some good science showing that people who are overweight or obese probably have cer a, a certain degree of leptin resistance as well. And I'm not super well versed in this literature, but I don't think it's as well studied as insulin resistance. Insulin, like we kind of know everything about insulin resistance. We don't know a ton about the mechanisms behind leptin resistance from my understanding, but we do know that people who are overweight or obese probably have a certain degree of leptin resistance because they're producing more leptin, but they're also eating more food. Right. right? So those things- Same thing that happens with diabetic, type 2 diabetics and insulin. Exactly. Exactly. And so when you lose weight, even though leptin concentrations reduce, there might be an improvement in leptin sensitivity, Okay. which is an important thing to consider. So hunger. We I'm with yes. you there. I don't, do you think it slows your metabolism though, Jay? We'll talk about this one okay, next. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. I wanted to point out, point out the ghrelin thing as well, okay. because a lot of these hunger-related hormones don't change just in response to weight loss or weight gain. They respond uh, acutely to how much food you're consuming. And the types right? of foods. Yes, exactly. I wanted to talk about types of Sorry, foods. Sorry, I'm doing it. Because, because, because I want to talk about these hormones, then I want to talk about metabolism. I'm interrupting so class. Like what you can I'm actually stop interrupting class. Right? Okay. Trust me, I've got my notes. I'm not going to. I came prepared. Um, I'm not interrupting about, class again. About Go ahead. And it's like, hey, even if I'm not losing weight, like if I just eat very little for a couple of days, obviously you're not going to lose a ton of weight in a couple of days, but your ghrelin levels are going to go up because the total food consumption is less, right? right? Yes, the types of food matter, but also the amount of food matters because how much your stomach stretch right. signals to your brain directly uh, what, like, whether you produce more ghrelin or not, right? So it's, it's very complicated, but I would also assume that somebody who has substantial weight to lose, who loses that weight, obviously being in a calorie deficit, and then when they, mean, they get to their ideal uh, weight and they increase their calories back up to maintenance, there's probably a regulation in ghrelin there, okay? So that's I'm not 100% sure about that, but just it makes common sense. And these things tend to regulate themselves and they're very responsive to acute changes in food intake, for example. Okay. Right? So it's more complicated than just saying you get hungrier when you lose weight. Because as you and I know, we can also do things with our diet to regulate our hunger, which we'll talk about. Right. right. Now, the metabolism thing. This one's interesting too, because there are changes in your basal metabolic rate when you lose weight. But it's not because... Your body thinks you're dying or right. uh, you're reducing your change of chances for survival. Your body it's size gets smaller, right? So yes. yes. Your weight is a big component of your metabolic rate, right? Because if, if you're carrying more stuff around, you require more energy. That's, that's literally what it is. And if you look at the equations that have been developed to, to estimate what somebody's metabolic rate is, your total body weight is like the biggest component. So yes, if you lose 50 pounds, yes, you're going to be burning less energy at rest. It just makes sense. Right. Right. So it's not, your metabolism isn't slowing down because you're losing weight uh, or, I mean, it is because you're losing weight, but it's not because your brain thinks that you're Right. Not. It's not some sort of right? thing where your brain is sabotaging you and like signaling yeah. a metabolic shutdown. You're physically yes. smaller and that plays a role in yes. your base metabolic rate. And this idea in this idea that it's a huge effect too is over exaggerated. It's a small difference in metabolic. It's like, oh, you lose a couple like if, pounds and the whole the whole hell's gonna break loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? No, it's probably that your your diet isn't in check. That's the honest truth, right? But um, yeah, if we look at like the the change in your energy expenditure if you lose like 20 pounds, yes, there's a change, but it's relatively minimal. I'm gonna throw out some random numbers here. These might be slightly incorrect, but it's probably like 100 to 150 calories. Like it's not a it's not a massive difference, right? right? Okay. It's a small difference in energy expenditure, but it, it does exist. Now, the other thing he mentioned is also that when you lose weight, you also burn less energy, not just because of metabolism, but it's this is true as well. Like when you're eating less food, your body inherently moves a little bit less, right? Because you have less food, you have less energy, you're likely to be a little bit more sedentary. Like Right now for this podcast, I'm standing. I'm energetic. Yeah. I was hungry. really hungry. I might be sitting and a little bit more sluggish. And there's less movement. So there's less uh, less energy being burned, right? And this is why I think it's really important. Like with all of my clients, I have them track their physical activity. Hey, let's have a daily step goal. So we're making sure that you're staying active, right? Because if you're eating less, but now you're also moving way less, well, that's not what we're trying to go for, right? So right. it's important to track your physical activity. If you simply track your physically, physical activity and stay equally active, then your energy expenditure isn't going to like magically reduce out of nowhere, right? That's an important thing to consider. Beyond that, if we talk about the hunger regulation stuff, as we mentioned, a big part of this is environmental. 
And a big part of this is also like, what does your diet look like? We know that there are foods that help regulate hunger more than others, right? If we talk about the number one thing, consuming minimally processed foods, right? A lot of these studies that look at changes in um, hunger-related hormones or energy expenditure, they don't really control for some of these variables, right. like diet quality, for right. example. Of course. Because again, I've worked with people and I see what improving your diet can do, right? I literally have clients tell me, oh, wow, I didn't know I could lose weight and not be hungry because I didn't know like these things were so beneficial, right? And what are these things? One, minimizing highly processed food consumption and consuming more minimally processed foods. That's the number one recommendation, I would say, across the board, independent of what you're eating. Right. There's actually a really good study by um, a really famous researcher in the nutrition space. His name is Kevin Hall. This study is like, it's been probably talked about, I don't know, thousands of times. But it's because it's a really great study to show the effects of food types on hunger regulation and food intake. Okay. They took two groups of people. Um, both diets that were presented were similar in terms of like caloric density. So like the amount of food per calorie. Uh, the same, Very similar in terms of sodium and very similar in terms of macro and micronutrient profiles. So nutritionally, diets were pretty similar. The main difference was that one diet was minimally processed foods mm-hmm. and the other diet was ultra processed foods, which is very different than just a processed food, right? right. Like these are things like French fries, Skittles, for example, it doesn't well, uh-huh. resemble, right? it. like, like I would say Soda. French fries obviously is processed food, but it's not as bad as like Skittles. Like that right. doesn't even resemble sure, food. Sure. Got a French fry resembles a potato, right? Understood. Like this stuff doesn't even resemble the, the actual food. Understood. And what happened? It's funny because the nutritional content, as I mentioned, was similar. And these people weren't tracking their calories. On average, the people eating the ultra processed diet eat 500 more calories per day. That's a lot. That's a lot. One day won't hurt, right? Like, so, I'm all about balance and enjoying yourself. Easily a pound a week, four while. pounds a month, exactly. 48 exactly. pounds a year. Up. I mean, my God. Think about yeah. that exponential. Well, of course you do. This is your job. Exponentially, <laughs> that's bananas. Yep. And if we go a step beyond that, talking about what other things you could do, well, we know that protein and fiber uh, really promote satiety, right? They reduce ghrelin levels. They help regulate hunger because, well, fiber creates a bulk uh, essentially in your intestine, soluble fiber specifically, because it draws in water. So it slows down digestion that helps you feel fuller, right? Protein also is very thermogenic. So you burn more calories, but it also helps with satiety regulation. Those are some of the main things you could do from a dietary perspective, right? Eating very voluminous foods, eating a lot of fruits and veggies. Like I try to tell this to my clients, like, hey, if you just eat more fruits and veggies, this is pretty simple. You will feel fuller. Whatever, whenever you have a meal, like I literally go in the fridge. I'm, I'm pretty boring with my nutrition. Like I could eat the same stuff and I'm good, but I'll have, if I'm having, for example, like rice and ground beef or something like that, I'll just grab a big handful of spring mix and just put it in my plate. Right. Um, it adds a ton of volume. It doesn't really add many calories. It helps you feel way more satiated for longer as well. So people simply make those changes. It is very possible to lose a lot of weight without feeling super hungry. And I emphasize here, super hungry because people are so scared of feeling a little bit hungry. There's also nothing wrong with being a little bit hungry. Like, hey, you're dieting, you're losing weight. I think it's important to also understand that you're going to feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But you shouldn't feel like you're starving either. That's also not good. And if you track your physical activity, another thing, lifting weights also, or regular exercise in general, helps regulate hunger-related hormones as well. That's another really cool thing. Um, If you're prioritizing sleep, because we know that sleep influences right. hunger-related hormones. Of course. There's also really good data that if you're sleep-deprived, the next day you have lower energy expenditure, um, you have greater cravings for calorically dense foods, and even when you eat the same number of calories, you have an elevation in hunger-related hormones. So sleep is incredibly important. It's, I mean, Common we sense. sound like a broken record because we're like, be healthy, exercise, yep. sleep, yep. manage your stress. But it's really the stuff that works. But it's it really matters because you you just have to keep reiterating it. And I think the reason for me to feel the need is because of messages like this, where it's like, uh-oh, you're going to lose weight. And then you're just, your brain's not going to allow it. It's not going to have it. And then yeah. God forbid you do hit that. Well, it's going to happen, right? Where you're like, uh-oh, I'm hungry. Yeah. This is normal. Don't worry, we get past this. Here are some tips and tools. But when you tell people that the brain's just not gonna have it and it's gonna make sure that you're yeah, incapable by destroying your metabolism and just it's like part bullshit, a little bit of truth, but totally avoidable. And once again, 
I am thankful. I thank you on behalf of myself, the audience, um, the people who are misinformed everywhere. <laughs> Tell them where they can get more from you, sweetheart. Yeah, for sure. If you guys want to learn about actual science when it comes to nutrition and exercise and living a healthy lifestyle, actual science. make sure to give me a follow on social media um, at Dr. Joey Munoz. Like I mentioned, I treat social media more as an entertainment thing. So if you guys want real education, check out my podcast, which is the Dr. Joey Munoz Show. Oh, my God. You, you know, It's you, funny, Jillian. I see sometimes because when I work with a client, the first thing I do is like do a dietary assessment and get an exercise history. It's really funny what people do for exercise. Tell me. Tell me one thing before I let you go. Um, just like, well, everybody team. that comes to work with me really wants to build muscle. It's like, that's what I talk about, right? Like muscle is good for health. It obviously makes you look good, et cetera. Okay. It's just like doing stuff on like BOSU. Like, listen, I'm not going to discourage exercise. Exercise is good for your health. But when you're trying to train for a particular goal, like building muscle, there's just some things that like don't make sense, right? Like squatting on BOSU balls or like doing squat with bicep curls and they're doing that to train your legs. And it's like your biceps are really weak compared to your legs. You're not really training your legs doing that. Just like these common mistakes, right? But it's really common. Like personal trainers at a lot of places prescribe these things. I don't know why. Maybe it's a lack of education, whatever. But all I was saying earlier is if you do have goals about around losing fat and building muscle and you want to do it in a healthy and sustainable way, transform your life forever. Check us out at fitforlifeacademy.health. Um, this is literally what we do with all of our members. We help them develop healthy habits around nutrition, learn how to train for muscle growth, and we have an awesome community of supportive individuals as well. Thanks, Jay. Can't wait to have you back. Keeping it real with Jillian Michaels.